Hello and welcome to the New Look Richard Hunter interview, where I sit down with guests who know the city best to talk about the trends, triumphs and turmoil that affect your investments. To kick things off, I'm joined by the first and still most popular guest from our podcast days, who has kindly agreed to speak with us again. Nick Train co-founded Lintzel Train Limited in 2000 and is the manager for its UK equity portfolios, including the Finsbury Growth and Income Trust. Nick has over 40 years experience in investment management and his approach is based on that of Warren Buffett's involving building a concentrated portfolio of quality companies that have strong brands and or powerful market franchises. The bulk of these are UK companies and this leads to a very different portfolio when compared to the benchmark FTSE All Share Index. So welcome once again Nick, thank you for joining us and thank you for hosting us. That is my pleasure, of course. As you say, for someone of my vintage, 40 years plus in the industry, it's, it's, it's nice to feel that people still think that maybe there's something relevant I've got to say. But um, let's explore that proposition with Very uh, what's so. to come. Now, when, when we spoke last year, you had said that unloved UK shares were offering cheap exposure to mega trends, providing a volume of opportunities. In fact, you went further than that, saying that uh, you'd barely seen such opportunities in four decades of investing. Your latest follow-up observation is as follows, but it is virtually the definition of financial markets that they deliver returns that confound consensus. Why is that, do you think? Well, um because once everybody has bought or everybody has sold, the next movement in a price is likely to go against the majority. And, you know, one of the most notable features I think I've witnessed over my career is the extraordinary disinvestment out of UK equities by British savings institutions, particularly pension funds. I, I think the statistic I saw today said that it, only 2% of a typical pension fund's assets are now exposed to the UK equity market. And when something has gone against an index or a market for so long, probably the next thing is a, is, is a reversal and a, and a surprise. There's really important wealth at stake here. The, there's no question, two things. One, that there are some truly substantive, important businesses quoted on the London stock market. That's for sure. The other thing for sure is that the UK stock market has delivered grievously disappointing returns now for longer than I care to, I, I, I care to, to, to consider. And the combination of the two means that, as you've suggested, I don't think it's difficult to demonstrate that there are many globally significant businesses listed on the London stock market whose share prices and valuations are low relative to history and low relative to global peers. And all other things being equal, that ought to amount to an opportunity. It ought to. I've got to hope so because I'm a dyed-in-the-wool uh, UK guy. Can I just mention one? Sure. Um, just because it's cheered my mood up a bit <laughs> so far in um, the tail end of last year and into, into 2023. For longer, again, I say this, than I care to consider, I've been trying to encourage and persuade investors to look upon Burberry as a great British brand one of the only, in fact, arguably the only luxury British brand that exists. And for six or seven years, my words have fallen on stony ground and the share price has flatlined for a long time. Um, but, and I'm not even sure I can explain to you why, since the end of September, Berber's share price is up something like 45%. And I'm so delighted. <laughs> um, but that's the way of things. You, you don't know when value might be released. All you know is for the longer that it isn't released, the potential is, is greater. And just because Burberry has had a 40% share price pop 
doesn't mean that it's all over yet. And I think by extrapolation, let's hope there are lots of other instances, both in the UK stock market, but more particularly the portfolios that I'm responsible for. Well, absolutely. And that um, kind of makes me wonder whether there are other factors at play for the fact that the UK market has been uh, effectively held back. Um, your investment approach, for example, says that your valuation work generates price targets very different from those of other investors and that you think that investors often use inappropriate equity risk premiums in valuation models, too high for exceptional businesses, too low for the mediocre. That's a complicated set of propositions there. L listen, it's not difficult to account for the disappointing performance of the UK stock market, um, uh, 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 particularly over the last half decade. I mean, it's had a whole load of political turmoil thrown at it, as well as other exogenous <laughs> uh, 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 uncertainties. I, 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 as I say, I'm just falling back on the proposition that, OK, so in the first week of um, this new year, there was a rumoured bid for Standard and Chartered Bank. Now, the potential bidder, which I think was Abu Dhabi Bank or something, has subsequently said, no, no, we're not going to make a bid. Um, but nonetheless, and I don't know that much about Standard and Chartered Bank. I mean, obviously, I've followed it for a long time, but I'm not an investor. But you look at Standard and Chartered Bank, that is a substantive business with an important franchise in Asia. You look at the share price and actually the shares are not much higher today than they were in 1997. 1997, yeah. that's a quarter of a century ago. The share price hasn't made anybody any money. And it's not the only substantive British company of which that's true. I'm just saying that creates an environment where things can happen or value can get released quickly perhaps as, as it's happened recently with Burberry. And I just don't want people to, to give up on that. Yeah. I'm also going to say this, if, if I may. Over the 70 year reign of our dear departed monarch, according to Bloomberg, OK, this is a Bloomberg stat, over the 70 years of Queen Elizabeth II's reign, the total return on UK equities was something like positive two and a half thousand fold, right? Over that same 70 year period, inflation was up in inverted commas only 20 times. In other words, for the bulk of the 20th century and into the 21st century, actually UK equity as an asset class did British savers a wonderful service. It protected it against inflation. And what's more, it helped build wealth as well. And I see no structural or conceptual reason why that shouldn't continue in years and decades to come. And OK, I'm a career long UK equity guy. Of course, I'm going to say this, but it bothers me and worries me that people might think that that somehow we've given up on the UK corporate sector or that you should give up on the UK corporate sector. Please don't, because there are substantive, globally significant companies quoted here that are very, very likely to help protect your wealth um, in years to come. Well, on the basis you have now gone past my next question, <laughs> I'm going to think of another one, which is that I was given a brief speech last night and a question from the floor was uh, from an old time broker who said that, what's the stock exchange playing out? We're not seeing very many IPOs at the moment. And part of the reply, obviously, who'd want to float in 2022 amidst that kind of turmoil? I said, however, I think if Nick Train was here as a, as a shareholder of the stock exchange, he would point you rather more towards what they're getting right in terms of their digital capabilities, their recent acquisitions and so on. And you have remained a fairly vocal fan of, of the stock exchange and its prospects. Well, no, no, absolutely. It's 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 one of our biggest holdings um, in my UK strategy. It's it's a nine percent holding, so it's a very very significant commitment that we've made of our clients' savings. The London Stock Exchange actually over the years 
partly by acquisition, partly by organic growth, has turned into a systemically important provider of financial services and data to the whole global financial community. And yes, I think that some of your, your viewers may recall last month, or it seems a long time ago, but, but as recently as December, the London Stock Exchange announced it was entering into a joint venture with Microsoft. As part of that joint venture, Microsoft has voluntarily, and presumably because Microsoft thinks it's going to make a lot of money out of it, bought or announced it's going to buy 4% of the shares of the London Stock Exchange. And to me, that joint venture with one of the world's most respected companies, Microsoft, of course, it, it, it's another indication of the strategic value that's present in the London stock market itself, as represented by the owner of the, uh, of, of the London Stock Exchange. And I do think Brits have a propensity to put ourselves down and look too much to the downside and not recognize what this corporate sector and what this economy has got going for it w would be my view. Just moving slightly to one side, I wondered if you had any views on, on primary research, you know, going out to meet the management face to face and, and whether you might have found any barriers in doing so as um, so notably quoted in recent <laughs> weeks by Terry Smith. Well, I, I, I'm sure like like Terry, be, be, because he has a similar, very, very strategic, multi-year perspective on the investments that he makes in companies. We, we've always had, in our opinion, very open and, and cordial access to the boards of the businesses that, that we've invested in. And there is a, a very regular exchange of strategic views about how businesses might best create value for, for their owners. I, I wouldn't expect for a moment, I wouldn't want to be in receipt of information that made us an insider or gave us any advantage over all other uh, uh, in, investors. Um, and actually, I've always said, and I still stick to the view, that uh, a private individual with a with a deep understanding of a company's product or service is just as likely to make a sound investment decision as someone like me who can sit down with the chief executive of a company twice a year. I really think that private investors are better provided with the information and the insight they need than sometimes they think themselves. I've just, I've just had an interesting conversation. Perhaps I won't say the company, but I've just been talking to the chairman of a of a, an important public company in the UK, and it's an important holding in our strategy. And I observed one or two developments that the company had announced that we thought were encouraging. And he said, but that's amazing. He said, you're the first shareholder who's actually mentioned those developments. And it, it just seems as though most of our shareholders don't really care about how the business is developing or they're more like a hedge fund who's looking whether how to trade the stock on the next you know yep. month's view. So from that perspective, yes, I think our, as you put it, primary research of actually looking to see how companies are developing on a quarter by quarter basis can still add some value. While you're here, I wondered what your views might be on the current debate around active versus passive uh, fund management. Um, and whether perhaps there's room for both? It's a truism to say that there, there is room for both. I do find myself conflicted by, by this. Um, can, can I, let me just share a, a statistic with you, okay? Since January the 1st, 2000, so the start of this century, millennium, whatever you want to call it, since January the 1st, 2000, the all share, the capital value of the FT all share index UK is only up about 30%. I mean, desperately disappointing, desperately disappointing. In the meantime, the MSCI 
world equity index in sterling is up about two and a half times. So much, much, much better. But the biggest holding in our UK strategy, give or take, Diageo, is up sevenfold over the last 22, 23 years. So absolutely done so much better than not only the UK market, but the global index as well. And to me, I don't find that difficult to understand. Do you, do you know what I mean? If, if you are the world's, if you own the world's best spirits brands and uh, consumption of spirits and premium alcohol has been rising and will continue, I don't find that difficult to say, why wouldn't you want a big investment in Diageo? So, so to me, that's a really powerful argument for active investment, that you can recognise a real obvious winner. But then again, it's only obvious in hindsight, you'll tell me. And I understand the power of, of, of trackers and, and passive strategies as well. Of course, your answer is right. There's, there's room for both. I do think that there's an emotional aspect to it and one that shouldn't be underestimated. I'm so lucky that in my career, I've been effectively been able to pursue a hobby. You, you could call it a hobby. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I want to fate measure or what's the, whatever the gambling. Yeah. You know, I, I yeah. want to have a bet on a, on a company. And I don't think that's a bad thing. And you don't get that if you're just buying a tracker. And I, I just, I think self-knowledge is really important. If you have no interest in companies, no interest in markets, then you need to be in the market, own a tracker. But if you've got any yeah. speculative instinct or you think you've got a perspective on why Guinness and Johnny Walker, you know, why they're such wonderful brands, then a, take an active position in a, in a magnificent company like that. And is again, that a good answer? It's a great know. answer I and leads into our final question, which you've probably half answered already. We mentioned at the top that you've been uh, in the city, certainly investing for 40 years. As far as I know, you've got no intention of retiring just yet. So what I was going to ask you is that after such a stint, what continues to bounce you out of bed in the morning? Kicking the bum from the wife. <laughs> <laughs> that's, normally, that's normally the first thing. Um, to, to, to be grubby, grubby with you, I've got quite a lot of skin in the game. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, this is my, I hesitate to say wealth. It is wealth by many people. It's, I, it's important that I get this right. And that, that's a powerful motivation. I, listen, I'm sure it's like, like you. It's, it, it, it's just the curiosity, isn't it? It's the curiosity to find out what's going to happen next. You know, I, I've not had a fantastic time over the last couple of years in terms of performance. And even when it isn't working out necessarily, I still want to know what's going to happen next, or at least why am I wrong? <laughs> if prices are telling me I'm wrong, OK, demonstrate to me what I've got wrong. And, and somehow that that's kept me going. I won't say it's kept me young, but it's kept me going. <laughs> Join the club. I've been in the... Uh city 40 years myself this year and it's that um, idea of a never having learned or knowing everything uh, and b simply not knowing what today is going to bring which uh, is just that that motivation that you need i agree anyway marvelous um to chat with you as ever nick thank you very much indeed for your time and of course for nick's valuable insights and thank you for watching i'll be back soon with another richard hunter interview but in the meantime, you can subscribe to the Interactive Investor YouTube channel for free by selecting the subscribe button. And of course, find more investment insight and ideas at ii.co.uk. Bye for now.